shelter, nutrition services, fun, and so much more. And here's more good news. You can get a welfare plan for a zero dollar monthly premium. How can welfare offer all of those benefits for a zero dollar monthly premium? It's simple. Medicare Advantage and Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage are important parts of Medicare. Welfare has a contract with Medicare to offer and provide these important options to you. Call right now to get your free copy of the Welfare All in One Guide. Call 1 866 450 5978. Now, there is absolutely no obligation for requesting this free information. Welfare offers benefits that go beyond the basics, including money added to your social security yeah. check to help cover your part. It's not here. What? I'm saying it's not here in this video. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. When is it? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, he's traveling today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's I see. Okay. All right. Then I guess we can probably get started. Um, yeah. So Amar is, is visiting from Santa Barbara slash Berkeley. Um, so she's going to tell us a little bit about cosmological colliders today. All right. Um, yeah. So it's great to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so my name's Mara. I have a PhD student at Santa Barbara, but I spend most of my time in San Francisco. And today I'll be telling you about a project uh, with my Mars and with my friend that we titled an effective cosmological collider. Okay, so as we all know, we have a lot of questions about uh, the gap to the standard model and how to get beyond the standard model. Uh, and all of these, these DSM theories can span a wide range of energy scales. Um, and we're kind of entering a new era of um, cosmology where we're getting really interesting, interesting experiments. Um, so 
for the CMB and 21 centimeter line um, and gravitational waves. So, one kind of interesting thing you can do, of course, is take all of these data sets, um, look at all of our DSM models, and ask how we can use cosmology to inform particle physics. So, how can we use these data sets to probe particle interactions? Uh, and kind of the, the way that I, I want to motivate this is that one of the most, kind of the highest energy kind of process in nature, within cosmology that we can actually observe, um, is inflation. And so um, the scale of inflation is pretty unknown, but it can be as high as 10 to the 13 GPV. So if you're able to probe up to the scale of Hubble during inflation, then this could potentially um, push our, our um, reach of DSM physics up to the scale, which would be obviously really nice. Um, there is a pretty large range of what Hubble during inflation can be. Um, so it's pretty uncertain exactly where we would be able to look, but um, low motivated parameter spaces. It's kind of on the higher end, so up to kind of the 13 GP. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we can use inflation to probe particle interactions. Okay, so we think of inflation, um, we can also think of it not only as uh, a process that is in the universe, um, we can also think of inflation as a source of particle. You kind of think of an analogy between a traditional Earth based accelerator um, and the process of inflation. So, just thinking about any collider um, that we would use here, uh, the way that we observe and make inferences about particle interactions is by starting with particle collisions. Uh, we take particle collisions, they produce many products, photons, electrons, and jets. We, and then the, the out product of that is we get a map of the energy deposition on a color. So this is an image from CMS that I stole, but this is just the, the basic process that I'm sure we all know. I mean, you kind of think about inflation as a similar process. So let's say we have some particle interactions for inflation. We don't know what those are. Um, these interactions can produce density perturbations. Um, so as a generic kind of, um, prediction of inflation, we expect some non gauge energies. Um, but if we have particle interactions during inflation, particularly if they interact with the inflaton, um, these can then create density perturbations. And then the ways that we can see this are through our maps of large-scale structure through the CMB and through the uh, Sorry to interrupt. Uh... I, uh, the, the sound is uh, too, uh, the volume is too low. It's impossible to, to listen on, on, on Zoom. Oh, can, do we have a we have a mic there? You can get the yeah. mic. In Is that better? Can you hear on Zoom now? Hello. <laughs> okay, is this better? No. Can the, can the people on Zoom hear? Uh, I, I don't. I still. Uh, it looks to me as that I, I cannot. I still cannot hear. No. Okay. Can you hear now? <laughs> Uh, no, it's better, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, than it was. But it's a little bit better, yeah. Okay. What about now? <laughs> okay. 
Okay. You have to speak louder and also it will propagate through the network. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Let me know if it becomes um, too quiet. Okay. So um, this program of kind of using these particle interactions or potential particle inter interactions during inflation um, and kind of analyzing them within the context of the CMB um, and these other large scale structure maps. Um, this has become known as the um, program of cosmological collider physics. So just to kind of motivate what, where this field is going and where it started. So back in 2002, um, as, as every good, you know, um, new direction in cosmology starts with a paper by Juan Maldacena. Um, he, of course, wrote this paper um, entitled non Christianities in Single Field Inflation. Um, and this really started the idea that you can have particle interactions that generate non-analytic signals, um, which then you could potentially probe within these large-scale large structure observables. Structure. Um, but we really got into the heyday of cosmological collider physics um, about a decade ago um, when people started looking at different models that had well-motivated particles that were of kind of the right mass range um, and kind of plucking a few operators here and there, studying their effects, um, studying what the standard model background would be. Um, in 2015, um, Nima and Juan wrote a paper kind of branding cosmological collider physics. Um, and ever since then, we've, we've got a lot of current collaborations that are working on studying various models that would be able to generate these, these signals um, within inflation. So I'll make this a lot more concrete um, in my next few slides. But this is just to say that this, this program, if you'll, this program is kind of really ramping up. Um, and especially with the near future um, cosmological experiments we have coming up, um, this could prove to be a really interesting tool for probing BSM physics. So just as a, a brief outline of what I'll be talking about, um, first I will make everything that I just said kind of more precise and go over some cosmological collider observables. Um, then I'll introduce this approach that we've, I've been working on with Nathaniel, um, which is essentially just applying a rigorous EFT formalism to cosmological collider physics. Um, and I will explain why that is interesting. Um, and we have, we're studying this um, in the context of a gauge Higgs model, mostly just as an illustrative purpose um, to see what the power of this approach is. Um, and then from there, kind of understanding these operator effects. So the thing that I kind of want to start with is that we have all of these current collaborations. Um, and so far, you know, we've, we've studied SUSY, um, we've studied the standard model um, within the context of cosmological collider physics, but there's not really yet a systematic way to understand um, the possible experimental signatures. Um, and this is what we really hope to do with this work. Okay, so getting into then some observables. So um, in this talk, I'm just going to focus on the simplest model of inflation. Um, so just a slow roll model. Of course, we, we can study other multi-field inflation um, and this kind of process applies there as well. Um, so kind of starting with um, a picture of what is happening. So let's say we have, we start with inflation. If we have some standard model particle or some new beyond the standard model particle, um, if it interacts with the inflaton, um, either in this kind of four point way or um, kind of at the lowest non Gaussianity with this um, three point function here, where we just set the fourth leg to a background value, this, um, this interaction, once you get to the reheating surface and the inflaton decays into standard model particles, um, this will leave an imprint in. Um, the last scattering surface, which of course we have in the context of the CMB. And then this will evolve throughout um, the evolution of the universe. And we end up at the present day with this, this overall large scale structure map. Um, and kind of with, within this period, um, another an interesting um, kind of way that this could manifest is within the 21 centimeter line. 
um, which is is really could be a really powerful probe for kind of getting this in between stage between um, the first thing that we know, which is really just the CMB, and the last thing we know, which is just the present day. Okay, so these interactions, since they can proceed um, with three or four legs, or at loop level, these are going to be generate these non Gaussianities. Um, and to a large degree, these non Gaussianities are nearly scale invariant. So the CMB two is mostly Gaussian. We haven't actually detected any of these non Gaussianities yet. Um, it's Gaussian to about one part in 10 to the five. Um, but these non Gaussianities, if observed, um, could tell us information about what happened during inflation. Um, particularly if these non Gaussianities are sourced by couplings from standard model particles or other particles to the inflaton. Okay, so we're going to focus then. So I have a question. So, yeah. so these particles they need to be massive or can. Yes, so they so do. They need to have a really big mass. Is that correct? Yes, so that I'll, I'll get to you in the next slide. Um, yes. Okay, so if we look at the three point function then, so the lowest order in Gaussianity, um, the first thing we get is just the bi spectrum. So here, um, these are going to be my curvature fluctuations. Um, and I'm going to have three of them interact. We can then define a dimensionless bi spectrum for convenience. And then what we really go out and measure when you measure these non Gaussianities is we end up with um, the metric of an FNL. So this just characterizes the strength of the non-Gaussianities. Um, what we actually calculate in from the theory side is this dimensionless phi spectrum. Um, and then the actual three-point function that we observe is dependent on the shape of um, kind of your correlators. So kind of in the previous slide, you get you can kind of think about these as um, just a literal three-point triangle correlation. And of course, we can have many different shapes for what this would be. So um, for reference, when we actually do these measurements, we're kind of measuring with respect to um, just an equilateral triangle. But interesting things happen when we get into a particular limit called the squeeze limit. And so this is the limit that you have three inflatons interacting um, in momentum space. They form a closed triangle. Um, and if we take the limit that one of the legs or one of the momenta is much smaller than the other two, then we get some interesting things start to happen. So particularly when we go and calculate the dimensionless bi spectrum for the inflaton, um, we get the following function. Um, and so some interesting points going on here is that kind of just when we, when we look at this initially, we have this um, this momentum that is dependent on this exponential um, factor here. Um, and so this, this mu is going to be a function then of the mass of each particle. And so this is going to come in as a ratio, particularly between the mass of the particle and the Hubble scale during inflation. So here we can imagine um, I have this exponential factor and I have this factor dependent on momentum. Um, and this signal, if I take the mass to be greater than Hubble, um, I get this distinct kind of non-analytic dependence. Um, and this, this shows up when the mass is greater than Hubble, but we don't want the mass to be too much larger than Hubble because then this kind of exponential um, suppression kicks in from this phase factor. And we don't want it to be too much less than Hubble, because in that case, you just get an analytic signal um, and there's no kind of characteristic oscillating feature. So this is really the, the power of the cosmological collider um, is the, the idea that the frequency of the non-Gaussianities that we could possibly observe um, is directly dependent on the mass. Yeah. So here, do you assume that this particle is scalar field or is it the same for fermions? Yeah, um, so here, so this, yeah, this right here um, is for a scalar field. You can also, um, I mean, this this factor here just changes um, depending on if you're looking at a fermion um, or a boson. Yeah. But the quantitative picture is not that different. 
No, no. So the only thing that would would change is just kind of yeah, these these factors here and uh, in your mu. Okay. <clears throat> is is there an easy way of understanding why I want m to be greater than h? Yeah. So um, if m is greater than h, this thing becomes positive. Oh um, yeah, I mean, and not get... from this formula. I mean, just like oh. just intuitively. Right? Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I mean, right, if the, yeah, if the mass is, is larger than Hubble, um, then you, when you go out and observe your non Gaussian entities, um, you get a frequency that just depends on the mass directly. Um, if it's less than Hubble, then you basically just don't see that oscillation. Um, and so the only way that you're going to get some kind of observable out is if you have the mass to be greater than Hubble. Is this re related to the, the field being frozen when Hubble is greater than the mass or something? Or? Yeah, um, right. So, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if the mass is, is greater, then your modes are, are going to um, freeze and then um, yeah, and then go beyond the horizon, and that's when you you can kind of recover these. these um, okay. Well, I'm asking why don't we want the mass to be less than that? Ah. I guess maybe it's just it's frozen. Are you saying that you can't, there's no signal for when the mass is less than Hubble? That's what you're saying? Yeah. Or rather, there, there is a, there's, there's, there's an signal. analytic signal. There's um, an analytic signal, but yes. you can't see it. You can't see it. Why? Um, yeah. Well, I guess you, so you get an analytic signal, but in that case, there's nothing that really distinguishes that signal from any other non Gaussian signal. Um, so, well, this, this is the behavior within the squeeze limit. Um, you can also have non Gaussianities that come from other shapes. Um, and in those cases, those signals are going to be analytic. And so you just don't really get this, this power of saying this is from a particle interaction so, with so this, this mass. Is, so yeah. this is distinct. This is distinct, yes. So when you say n is greater than h, you get this signal and you can just definitively say that it's from a mass of particles or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, modulo some experimental yeah, difficulties, but. Sorry? And also, you can extract the mass of this particle, right? Like uh, just from dissociation. Yeah. Yeah, but if it's a uh, you know, super massless, then you can uh, extract that. So, I'm sure. Yeah, they, they do have to be, they do have to be massive. Yeah, yeah, but then uh, you can't see dissociation. So, you can't get any information, or you can't say, like, maybe it's coming from. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this this kind of the fact that you get this this range, um, ideally you want this mass to be a little bit larger than Hubble, or rather like three halves Hubble, but um, a little bit larger. So then you get this non-analytic distinct signal, but then you don't get any of the exponential suppression that you might get when the mass is much greater than Hubble. Okay, so this kind of establishes a nice window for us. Um, as long as we have a well motivated model in which you have some fields that get to mass that is around Hubble during inflation, um, you get this nice oscillating signal. If you were to go look and see we have a non Gaussianity with this particular frequency, um, that would be a really, a really you know, great clue to as to what this particle could be. Um, and in this case, so this is kind of how um, the cosmological collider really acts as a collider. So when we go out and make our observations, um, we're kind of looking at the non-Gaussian entities as the product of all of these particle collisions that happened early on in the universe. Okay, and so when we look at our diagrams for these particle interactions, they look very similar. I mean, they're just Feynman diagrams, um, except here there, there is some kind of time dependence. So here um, I'm gonna take eta to be the time at reheating. So this is just when my inflatons then decay into other fields. Um, and we're going to say that in the far past, 
um, there was some interaction between the inflaton and some other field. Um, and then we're going to take this momentum to be very small. So this means that we get a non-local um, interaction. And we can calculate these things for trees, um, also for loops. They're pretty complicated for loops, but we can do them. Yeah. So what is the assumption between the interaction uh, between that particle and the inflaton? Are you assuming this gravitational interaction? And if I introduce error coupling, does that modify this problem? Um, yeah, so all you're assuming here is that there is some coupling um, between these two fields. Um, so you can you can introduce a, a gravitational coupling of the inflaton, um, and you know that that would also get you a similar signature. Um, but all you really need to do is to say I have some VSM model, I have some interaction with the inflaton with some coupling strength. Um, so as long as you get diagrams that can look like this, then you can use this formalism. I guess my question is, uh, is the signal strength dependent on the size of the coupling? Uh, or... Yeah, um, right. So yes, um, yeah. Um, it, it would be dependent on the strength of the coupling. Um, and that really comes in, I guess, when, you, when you're actually looking at your operators and um, calculating what the, the Wilson coefficients are. Uh -huh. um, Right. So you, you do need some some strength for the purposes of this talk. I'm just going to assume order one couplings. Um, but yeah, in principle, you, you do need to know that. If you assume the normalized stuff, right? Yeah. So you're not assuming normalized, you're not assuming high dimension. So that, would, that would make the signal much smaller. Right? Um, so you do, you need, um, so kind of, I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll get to this in, in a couple of slides, but um, you do basically get all these coupling through your relevant operators. Um, yeah. Okay. So when you kind of go back then to our analogy of thinking of inflation as a collider, in a, in a usual particle collider setup, um, the thing that we're actually looking for in our maps of this energy deposition um, is just peaks in my distribution of invariant mass. And so here, it's kind of the same idea. Um, these peaks then, of course, kind of inform us about what these particle collisions were. And here, you're looking for peaks in the cosmological correlator itself, or rather the Fourier transform of it. Um, and the idea is that with these peaks, we'll be able to um, start to probe these interactions in inflation. Okay, so kind of getting into the, the approach that myself and my collaborators are working on. Um, when you have, so we're thinking about um, couplings to the inflaton. And so kind of getting back to your question, um, because there is this approximate shift symmetry when we go out and observe the CMB, this implies that all of our couplings to the inflaton are going to proceed through um, this derivative here. So because they all have to be um, shift symmetric, we just impose this um, via taking the derivative of the inflaton. Um, and because of that, the lowest order coupling that you can get is at dimension five, um, at least to a standard model or other particle. So all of these operators are going to be irrelevant operators. And if you just look at any model, um, all we're going to do is just write down um, our operators in you know, the following schematic form, just some standard model or other operator um, and some function that is, is dependent on this derivative coupling. Yeah. So, um, I missed this, why so does it have to be shift symmetric? Yeah, so it's, it's so just- it's the input on in principle can couple in any way. In principle, um, but we do observe kind of an approximate scale invariance. Um, of the CMB. And so if you take that into account, then kind of to first order, at least, you should expect a shift symmetric input on. I guess another way of saying this is if you put in non shift symmetric couplings, then that mm -hmm. could change the potential drastically. And you would, yeah, you think it wouldn't be flat for the next little row. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's another way of saying it. Oh, you're just saying we're just trying to preserve the flatness of the potential. That's, that's, that's the natural idea. 
Okay. So. Typical scale modeling. Yeah, um, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but you could still preserve the flatness of the potential around the upper and like sterile, but it's still very flat. Yeah. Like that, right? right. You, I mean, you can look at, at other models here. I'm just looking at the simplest um, slow rule model of inflation. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe more the same is if anything new you want to add on top of variability, you want to be derivative of couple so doesn't change. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this means that you know with an EFT, um, kind of the way that we that we think about EFTs in flat space. Um, is you know finding an operator basis to agree upon, um, making sure that operator basis is minimal so you don't have any redundancies. Um, and this is a little bit more complicated for the cosmological collider program because you have all of these operators being relevant operators. So in the standard model, really all of your interest in physics happens, you know, dimension six or lower. Um, here you we are considering operators up to dimension eight, dimension nine. So things get um, a lot more, you know, difficult to handle there. Um, so when we think about then our, our toolkit for doing EFTs and considering EFTs, we're going to use just the, the same kind of the same toolkit as we use for flat space, just the, the basic equations of motion, integration of parts, field definitions, um, except we do have to keep in mind that um, well, this is, is pretty simple in flat space because you know, your um, field definitions or your um, correlator is guaranteed to be invariant. And with integration by parts, you get these boundary terms and those are guaranteed to vanish. Um, so during inflation, we approximately work in the sitter space. And so this picture becomes more complex, as you will see. Okay, so as an illustrative example of how this proceeds, I'm going to go into then a gauge Higgs model. And this is, I think, a pretty interesting model just to, to start with. Um, it does have a, you know, a, we only include three fields, so um, we don't have that many operators to work with. Um, so here we're just going to have a Higgs field, uh, which is just my curly H and um, Z is going to be um, my gauge boson of a U1 symmetry. So we can think about Z as either the standard model Z or any other U1 gauge boson. Um, and so in order to, to motivate any model, we have to think of a reason why the mass should be roughly of order Hubble. And so if we're looking at the standard model, you can kind of think about um, the Higgs coupling non-minimally to um, gravity during inflation. So you can think of this coupling um, to my curvature. Um, and this is going to give you kind of this, this square dependence um, where your mass is, is roughly of order Hubble, of course, with some dependence on the self-coupling. Um, but you can you know, see, see an instance where this mass is, is well motivated to live at the scale. Another thing you can think about is just, which I think is a little bit more interesting, is just looking at any abelian Higgs model in the early universe. Um, we might expect any number of U1 symmetries at high energies. So this could be one way to probe these kinds of models. Um, and in general for any, any DSM model as well. Okay. So here I'm going to be a little bit kind of pedantic um, just to, to illustrate what this looks like. So my marginal Lagrangian is just going to have the following terms. My covariant derivative is just dependent on this Z here. And because we um, because we, we've put this, this shift symmetry to our inflaton, um, the first operator dimension that we're going to get anything really happen um, is at dimension five. So kind of naively, if you were to just look at this EFT and write down um, the next operators that you can get. Um, 
you can get the following, which is kind of secretly shift symmetric. Um, and this, uh, this has been kind of pretty widely studied before. So um, I'm not going to focus on this operator in this talk. Um, instead, I'm going to focus on this other operator that I can write down. Um, so just one, one coupling to a derivative inflaton here. And so let's just take this operator and see what you can do with it. So the first thing I want to ask is, does this fit into a minimal operator basis? Um, OK, and when I expand this out, I get a real term and an imaginary term. I can look at my real part and say, OK, let's take my inflaton, redefine it, um, choose this, um, this parameter here just to align with all of the parts that are shifted in my marginal Lagrangian. Um, and I'm going to pick up this extra term when I do this, but then this is going to disappear. So all I'm picking up is just an operator that is dependent on the Higgs and not the inflaton. So this you would expect not to contribute to the three-point function. Um, and for the, my imaginary piece, I can do the same thing with the Z, make a field redefinition, choose my parameter. Um, and I pick up here this dimension six operator. Um, and so this is pretty important here because when I do these, um, these you know, redefinitions, I make my, my operator redundant, my dimension five operator redundant. And so um, it then appears that nothing really interesting happens until we go to dimension six. Um, really kind of dragging this out just to, to see what we can do. We can also use integration by parts and equations of motion. Um, for my real parts here, um, I'm just going to get some boundary term. Um, this here, because I'm working in a slow roll model of inflation, this is just going to get used some slow roll suppression. Um, and I'm going to get this boundary term, which you can show does vanish. Um, and then the same is true of my imaginary piece. So again, I pick up the boundary term. Um, this guy vanishes. Um, and I can show again that this will also vanish at the boundary. So this kind of looks like what we do in usual flat space EFTs. Um, but here you really do have to check that your field redefinitions don't add new terms to your correlator and that these boundary terms don't end up um, contributing overall. And so we then come to the conclusion that the dimension five operator is redundant. And so this is, this is important. Um, because when we, when people have looked at cosmological collider physics and looked at any operator and studies its effects, um, if you kind of naively just write these down and you can see operators like this in the literature, um, it is important, of course, to make note which ones are redundant and which ones are not in order to isolate the physical effects that you're actually going to get from your models. And then kind of going up to higher and higher dimensions, um, this is a dimension six operator we got from um, the previous dimension five exercise. And when we work this out at dimension eight, you might expect to get something like the following operators. So there's a lot going on here, but kind of the two that I want you to focus on um, is numbers five and six here. So these are just the usual field strength terms that we would write down for my gauge boson. Um, and right, okay. These are so these are the usual terms that I would write down here um, to get actually get all of these operators and check that they are redundant. We did end up using um, some EFT software because dimension eight is tricky. Um, but the result that we really get from this exercise is that these operators also end up being redundant. So. This shows up especially in the standard model literature for the cosmological collider. Um, and the fact that in this basis where you have the dimension six operator, you can show that these operators are also redundant. Um, this is you know, a, a good result to have. Um, it shows you exactly which operators give you physical effects. Um, and it also just kind of illustrates that when we do this process, we really want to make sure which operators are redundant and which are not. Um, and so when you calculate then the effects that you get from the gauge boson, we are then going to include, oops, um, 
these other operators instead of these guys. Okay, so we've kind of established what our minimal basis is now um, for this gauge Higgs model. And let me get into a little bit about um, the effects of these operators. So one nice tool that we have um, for our EFT is that we can kind of pretty quickly um, classify the operators in terms of the size of their Wilson coefficients. So this tells us if they're renormalizable at tree or loop level. Um, and we pretty much get that all of these Higgs dependent operators come from tree level. And of course, all of these um, higher order field strength operators come in at loop level. Um, but this is nice because kind of it gives us the schematic to work with. We can pretty easily see right off the bat um, what, um, what the order is of the effects of these operators, at least. Why, for instance, does the phi CFC dual one, like why is that a loop level operator? Yeah. Um, so this is a loop level operator. Um, oh. Sorry? Oh, I was going to say it's just the anomaly of drawing the diagram. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so to actually do any useful estimation with this, we do want to look at our parameters and see roughly what they can be. So the first things I'm going to do is just look at the scales of lambda. So we don't want these inflaton self interactions to dominate because we are in a slow roll environment here. So we do, we do require um, lambda to be greater than about 60 um, orders of Hubble. And then to have a controlled EFT expansion, we want this ratio of the Higgs bev over lambda to be less than one. Um, and here you, you kind of have, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, no, I just wanted about operators. Uh, if you consider the limit where, say, Higgs mass is very high, okay? Uh, I'm just trying to, to check this uh, operator basis. In the limit where a mass of Higgs is very high, then uh, it's like just massive vector, vector field, right? And that's it. I mean, uh, no, because, and it is a billion models, so you can take the limit of uh, very high Higgs, very high mass Higgs, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you, because... you can't yeah, because then, um, no, I mean, uh, in this case, say, no, uh, no certain top, uh, uh, part, I mean, uh, I mean, then you do not need to write Higgs field per se, but, but uh, it would be just massive vector field, right? I mean, no, I think that there should be less operators in this limit, uh, that, that's why I wonder. Um, sorry, so you're just saying that you can write limit or no 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 because it's not when you are uh, discussing a relation between operators or whatever, then that there is also kind of uh, i mean particular no maybe it's academic limit but still the limit where higgs mass is uh, the, uh, is heavy right uh, and then then uh, then you know kind of the, you do not have dynamical higgs field right uh, the, the only effect of higgs would be like a, uh, giving a mass to, to z yeah, so, um, I mean, I guess here we're just considering just a usual Higgs doublet. We're not considering uh -huh. those kinds of limits. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, but it is like a, a little bit kinematical, right? Because you can ch see be, uh, kind of classified operators which are kind of uh, exist in this limit, which you do not, but maybe it's not that interesting. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if that would be interesting. Um, I guess I would have to, to get back to you on that. Yeah. No, be, no, because uh, the reason I'm asking because it means that you are implying in certain way you're considering, you know, the theory in in the uh, um, in the phase. I mean, be, be before uh, vacuum average of Higgs field appears, right? 
So, so, so it's at, at, at your early stage. But what I am talking when I am talking about uh, uh, heavy Higgs, it implies that vi vacuum. Uh, no, I mean it's interesting when you are going to the, to the case where uh, I mean already vacuum average of a Higgs field is there, uh, but the physical Higgs does not show up because of heavy mass. I see. But Arkady, I think you have to take the quartic coupling very large to infinity, right? Uh, so... Right, right, but this limit does exist, as you know. In, in yeah, 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 it does exist. You get nonlinear sigma model, but I don't yeah, know yeah, right. realistic. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, of course. If you are putting here uh, mass of Higgs uh, uh, large, uh, yeah, of course it's uh, uh, large lambda, right? But but then I it's uh, I'm wondering because how much is important? Uh, uh, is it important for you know consideration of non gaussianity or not? I am not sure. That's why I'm asking. I see. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I mean, yeah, I think in, in that limit, I'm not sure that, I mean, in that regime, you might get into um, a situation in which you, you get this Boltzmann suppression, um, especially if you take an extremely heavy Higgs. Um, I'm not sure if that's the scenario that you're, you're talking about, but. Because you're already taking the Higgs mass to be like one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all we're already taking the Higgs mass to be basically the upper limit of what Hubble would be or could be. Um, and so in that case, you would kind of spoil the signal that you would get um, from the Boltzmann suppression factor um, that I introduced on a previous slide. Okay. But, but can I also ask, so the number of independent characters different in the seeker and in the Minkowski because of some boundary spectrum? Um, I think you, yeah, so you still have the same number of parameters, um, but you do need to consider the, the behavior of the boundary more. Right. Um, so the main difference in the sitter is that none of these, these things that we assume in flat space DFT, like the LSE reduction formula, um, are guaranteed in the sitter. Um, so what we're really doing in the sitter is instead of even, we, do, we don't even know what the um, boundary, or rather what the, the long-term evolution would be for these interactions. And so um, we can't use the same kind of S matrix formalism that you get from flat space DFT. All right, any other questions? All right, so because we're doing an EFT here, we do want this ratio to be less than one um, and not too much, not too close to one in order to you know, control our expansion. Um, but we can kind of consider an upper estimate of about half to a third. Um, this doesn't, and this doesn't really spoil your EFT expansion, but it does kind of give an upper bound for what the largest signal would be. So I'm just going to take, um, take this limit here. And because that can you know, presumably be this high, um, this tells us that kind of off the bat, tree level diagrams are going to dominate even for kind of these processes that you would normally consider to be lambda suppressed. Um, so this will become important later on when I um, when you go into what the um, what the strengths are, signal strengths are that you get from the um, field strength operators, or rather not the field strength operators, sorry, the dimension eight operators um, for the Higgs. So here's just kind of a very schematic rough diagram of what we would expect. So all of our field strength operators are going to be pretty highly suppressed. Um, the ones that we're really considering occur at dimension eight. And these only proceed through loop level diagrams. So, well, these are important to calculate just to have a complete picture of our EFT. They kind of in practice won't really um, give us any FNL that would be observable. Um, we would expect our dimension six operator to dominate here, 
But one interesting thing that we can kind of get from this is that even at dimension eight, um, these effects still can be important because we, we can take this ratio to be, um, you know, order 0.1. Um, this effect is going to overall contribute to my FNL. And so when we do write down these theories and we consider all of the irrelevant operators that can happen from in-photon interactions, we're going to need to go to a high operator dimension to really understand what is happening. Um, right. So here we, we considered um, dimension eight. Um, in some theories, even dimension nine can be important. Um, yeah, okay. So with that, let me get into a little bit of the formalism that we use to actually calculate these signals. So um, as I was saying before, the main difference in this picture is that we're working in visitor space. And so um, in contrast to flat space QFT, when we're really you know, just interested in the in out picture of my um, correlators. Here, what I want is we use um, the in informalism because we don't really know what my out states are going to be. So instead, we sum over my um, in states and we're going to proceed in the interaction picture. And so, what I'm really interested in then is what the um, correlation function is of some product of operators. These are just the operators that I'm considering in my EFT. Um, rather than just the usual time ordering, we're going to get an anti-time ordering piece as well as a time ordering piece. And then we are, since we're, we're interested in um, these operator products at a given time. Um, and this is because we, um, we, we only observe what, um, we only observe the final product within the, the context of the CMB or any other observable. Um, and so this is going to be taken at a given time here. So when we actually use this, we can think of our interactions just as any perturbation series in my interacting Hamiltonian here. And at leading order, um, I just get the following. So this is kind of the first order um, tree level approach that I get. And this is a really, really good estimate for actually calculating these diagrams. Um, and in the squeeze limit, they actually simplify somewhat further. Um, so again, I have this boundary taken to be um, conformal time zero. I have here my two inflatons that um, survive to the boundary. Um, and this, this red line here is just going to be my other um, standard model or otherwise particle that interacts with the inflaton. Um, and because I get this, that these masses are much larger than this map, than, sorry, than this momentum over here, this kind of becomes an effective vertex. Um, so I can greatly simplify the calculation of these diagrams. Um, and this really produces kind of two sub diagrams here. Um, because this is a long distance interaction, I really just have to compute um, this kind of first diagram and then the second diagram over here. And this is what ultimately becomes my effective vertex. Um, okay, so this is just, yeah, just kind of to illustrate how these are calculated. Um, I'm going to find my propagators for both the inflaton and then my massive internal propagators, um, add up all their contributions. And that's how I get my dimensionless bispectrum from each diagram that I'm considering. And then we can think about a number of different types of diagrams. We can get kind of the usual single exchange that we think about. Um, we can also think about the case in which we have more than one particle exchange, um, but we do need to keep these legs fixed as the inflaton um, at the repeating surface. And so here, we're going to incorporate a mixed propagator um, into this leg um, to get my double exchange diagram and then my triple exchange diagram kind of proceeds in, in the same way. Uh, but your uh, triangle, uh, I believe, originally could be uh, singular in, in the limit when K3 goes to zero. Uh, remember, it was a power, one over K3 certain power, right? Uh, well, what is behavior at small k3? Sorry, can you repeat that? 
Uh, no, when you, 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 you talked about, you know, this um, uh, uh, kind of scaling behavior at, at, uh, as function of momenta, I believe that the, the, the result was that at small K3, it, it, it behaves like inverse power of K3 in certain power. Uh, yes. Right. Uh, so, so, so in this, so you are in, in the limit where this kind of enhancement is present with this triangle. Yeah. Um, sorry. So, if I'm, yeah. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, you're just asking um, about. Triangle, uh, no, not just triangle. When you wrote, remember this power of k's. Uh, you know, do they refer to this triangle or, or it's not relevant? Remember, you you wrote this uh, this behavior as function of k one, k two, k three. Yes. Um... So, Akadi's asking if this triangle corresponds to the momentum triangle that you uh, use for k1, k2, k3, uh, and the answer is no. Okay, oh. sorry. I totally misunderstood your question. Um, the answer, yeah, the answer, the answer is no. Um, it's a different triangle, Akadi. Mm -hmm. No, no. So, so it means that kind of, uh, no, in certain way, interaction is not uh, is enhanced uh, by triangle, right? Uh, if if it go, uh, if it uh, it's small case three. Um, but maybe I, I got it wrong. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, it is enhanced if you if you have a, a small K three. Um, here, I'm just I'm just kind of considering. The generic limit where k3 is much much smaller than the other two legs mm -hmm. and so we're not really controlling um what the size of the k3 momentum is um all we're interested in is just this scenario where we approximately take k1 and k2 um to be of the same order um and then k3 is just going to be much smaller so I mean, it is dependent somewhat. It is dependent on what the momentum of K3 is. Um, but presumably, when we're actually looking at these signals, um, I mean, that's that's kind of something that that you would get um, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell um, with just with just the, the information that you get um, from this oscillating signal. Um, so I think really the only information that we can get at least currently is the mass of the particle. Um, and you can also factor in some spin dependence. And those are really going to be your distinguishing factors for what field you're looking at. Okay. Wait, yeah. question. When, when you have these like mixed propagators, mm -hmm. And, and I think of that as a vertex, like as a inflaton in a standard model vertex, where you just took one of the inflaton legs to be the background. I think it's like the same thing. Yeah, um, yeah, it it is pretty much like that. Here, all you really do is um, compute a propagator where you start with um, some derivative inflaton here, and then one of your massive particles here. Um, I also ask this main question. So you have this operator to form d phi times some standard model operator, right? Uh -huh. And in this d phi, phi is supposed to be this inflaton perturbation, inflaton particle. Yes. Uh, but in principle, if you say phi, if you expand phi as the ground phi plus some delta phi, and you treat the delta phi as perturbation as a particle, mm -hmm. but this phi, which is background, it is also uh, evolving, right? It's so overall. So in principle, d phi at the background level is also not zero. It's proportional to epsilon theta. It's on the slower of parameters. So does it, does it change this uh, feature? Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you do expand it in terms of its background value, um, because we're only coupling derivatively, um, you're only going to get a background value that is, you're only going to get a time derivative of your background value. Yes. Um, and so you can take that to be slowly varying. Okay, so you're, you're taking this operators and then you do this expansion. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll 
South Australian Commission. So in this, uh, you know, uh, red most line, like a black line. Mm -hmm. So the red line goes to the black line, right? So the, is it true that you're also using the mixing term there? Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, so all these. So, am I yeah. correct that the front uh, single operator, uh, you have a choice like uh, whether you pick up the web or you pick up the particle, and then you can have a bunch of variety of interactions from one single operator. Mm -hmm. And that you can use P and P. Yeah, and uh, sometimes you can have mixing, sometimes you can have interaction, something like that. Exactly, yeah. Um, so when you're actually doing these calculations and expanding, um, you do have a lot of background values floating around and you can pretty much set any leg to its background value see, see, see. Um, to get these kinds of terms. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you can also calculate some loop level diagrams. Um, and here, calculating the, the loop directly, um, is really not quite feasible analytically. Um, and so the, the method that we use is to take this um, limit of the operator product expansion. Um, and so here, all we really do is consider the um, late time behavior of, um, of, these, um, of these propagators um, and then kind of calculate um, what my what my late time um, behavior would be from there. Um, this kind of gives me just a, a, a rough, but um, that's kind of the best estimate that we have so far for what the, the loop diagrams would be. Um, yeah, but I don't know if I explained that well. Okay, so when I actually then go and calculate the approximate form of my FNL, um, we can see that my dimension six is going to kind of scale as we might expect. Um, when we get to our triple exchange diagram for the Higgs, we're also going to get some contribution just from the Higgs self-coupling. Um, and so the triple exchange does kind of give you the same order as the double exchange diagram. And then for this dimension eight operator here, this is really just going to depend on this ratio of the VEV um, to my lambda. And this is, I mean, this is a, a power to the fourth. Um, and again, this, this kind of ratio can be as high as one half. So here, this might not kind of seem to be um, as apparent when we're just as important when we're just looking at the contribution of one operator. When I actually go and compute the size of my FNL, I'm going to get kind of 0.1 um, contributions from each of my single, double, and triple exchanges. Um, pretty much for, and then for any kind of dimension eight effect, we're just going to get something that happens at um, roughly 0.01. So this is, is pretty much too small to be observable. This does get you in a range where um, you can get some signal probably from the 21 centimeter line, um, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later. But just to kind of be as complete as we can with this picture, we in practice don't want to just turn on one operator, we want to turn on all of the operators in our theory. And so when we go through and do this, for example, you're going to get um, contributions of the dimension six operator mixing with this dimen these dimension eight operators. And so just looking at this first operator, um, I can just write down or just draw rather the same diagram that I would get at dimension six, um, except I now just um, have a dimension eight insertion instead of a dimension six insertion um, for one of my legs. I can get these two new contributions here. And because my ratio of V over lambda can be as high as, as one half, or rather, <clears throat> yeah, it can be as high as one half, um, this is going to give us actually a pretty non-negligible contribution to my overall FNL. And so this effect, so this is just at um, tree level and the single exchange diagram. This also shows up in the double and triple exchange diagrams. So when you really go through and systematically calculate all these effects, um, you're going to get an overall FNL that is, you know, it gives you roughly a, another, you know, quarter contribution to the overall FNL. So this is a pretty significant contribution, at least for the case where you have this ratio um, to be large. So overall, 
for my Higgs processes, we're going to get an FNL that is of order 0.1. Suppression scale of the theory finally. Here the lambda is one half. When here the lambda is one half, ah. you get the point one. Ah. Yes. So you have to have this very kind of tuned value, right, to get the maximum effect. Right? Yeah, yeah. So here, here we're looking at what the maximum effect would be. Um, of course, if you do have this this ratio to be much smaller, then yeah. in practice, your mixed your multiple operator effects wouldn't be as important. Um, but so this. Yeah. You have to be a little bit lucky. You do have to be a little bit lucky. Yeah. 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 That's okay. B is, B is the bed of the input one, right? Uh, this is the the, 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 the yeah. value of the input one, right? Yes. Higgs. No, of the of the Higgs. Sorry. Sorry, the Higgs. Sorry. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Yes. Ah, right. So B is also the Hubble. Yeah. Sorry, I think I'm running a little low on time. Okay. Um, okay, so when you go back to kind of this rough picture of what my operator effects are, if I am lucky and I get this this V over lambda to be a half or so, um, these really contribute, I mean, these contribute um, over the dimension eight operators, um, but they also get pretty close to what you would get for just the dimension six operator. So when you're actually going through, um, and you want to see what the physical signals are, it's important to not just kind of pick out one operator, but um, turn on all of them. So, I mean, in practice, this would be difficult because you're looking at a lot of operators that are out there. Um, but, you know, presumably this could be expanded. Um, Sorry, but can I ask a quick question? So if you have a lambda is of order one half, you need that to get this from the shining to order 0 0.1 then, what really suppresses all you know higher higher order operators, right? What really suppresses all? Yeah, I mean, so you do get a, a V over lambda suppression. Um, here we're just assuming that that you know this this we're taking this this suppression to be um, kind of the minimal suppression that you can get. Um, so we're trying to get a maximum F and L here. So basically, you're saying that the cutoff scale of this effect of zero is a order of Hubble. It's a order of Hubble scale, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, like order 10 Hubble. Is it for information? Well, I, I guess as soon as you restate yourself to the derivative of operators. Yeah, so, so in, this, in this just flow role model, um, Actually, I mean, the fact that you, you do get this this large cutoff um, really comes from the fact that we are considering um, just yeah this it's just the slow roll model, um, and we don't want in that case my kinetic energy of my inflaton to dominate, and that would mess up what you're. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering how you can say suppose you observe some order shining, right? How how you can say which operators they correspond to if it looks like there are like infinite many operators that are going to contribute the same level. Yes, so I right. I don't I don't think you could go rather to the operator level. Um, but over, I mean we could, we'd see the overall FNL. And so if we're thinking about you know comparing an FNL prediction from some VSM model to an FNL that we actually observe, um, it's not as important to kind of to pick out what the operators would be, but we can kind of play similar games as in um, you know, a traditional particle collider. Um, and and make theory predictions based on um, all of these effects. Looks like you observe the FNLs and you can say for sure that there is there is some new physics. Yeah. But <laughs> what, what else can you say for sure? But that, but there right. is also some oscillatory feature. Right? Yeah, yeah, so there, there's this oscillation. Ah, okay, so we're going to see. Some so at least you can say the marks, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know whether um, you can say that. The, there's, also, there's also a piece that I didn't really discuss as much, but you can also get some spin information um which would so there there are are multiple features that you can get that would help distinguish these um i mean it's it's the, it's really the same as what we would get in an accelerator scenario where we see a peak in what the mass distribution is um and then we kind of have to you know go back to our, our theory predictions and 
figure out from there what that particle really is. Yeah. Let me ask a very trivial question. Let's mm -hmm. take the simplest operator, h dagger h times d phi square. Mm -hmm. So if d phi squared is not zero because of the inflaton, then it effect, it's effectively a Higgs mass, right? Because it's uh, g h h more absolute value h squared times some number mm -hmm. of dimension of mass squared. Okay, so okay, okay, it, it will have to be first dimension six, right? Uh, two, 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 six. So it will have to be divided by some parameter of dimension squared, like your lambda square. Yes, right? yes. This is so just a... what the what do you expect if I substitute the numbers after all? What do you expect to get for the coefficient in front of h square? So the coefficient in, in terms of G V or M E V, what do you expect? Yeah. Um so um I mean, it is, it's a, the thing is, that, I mean, it's dependent on, you know, what the, the Higgs Bev is. It's dependent on what the scale of lambda is. Um, and of course, you do have, you know, some. But take problems. some representative value, Paul Park. I don't ask you a point. Sure. Point, be, point uh, zero, zero. This should be Hubble squared. So it, should, it should be Hubble squared. So 10 to the 13 GV, is that correct? Yeah. That's right. But then it's incredible, right? What, what sense does it make? But it's only during inflation. So ah, it's during yeah. during if you write h dagger h, dagger h and you couple it to r to a curvature, and during inflation, it gives a huge mass to Higgs, but now it's fine. Ah, it's okay. okay. Inflation. It's all uh, during the inflation, even yeah. before the heating, yeah. before everything, and yeah. then we don't yeah. care how <laughs> large it is. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Right, so this is right. So this is all happening in in the S space, um, and so during there, when in that scenario, you get a, a pretty non minimal Okay, feeling. okay. Then the second question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just to get some picture. Okay, let's assume there was this interaction, and during inflect inflation, the Higgs mass was ten to the thirteen GV. What traces? of this huge Higgs mass during inflation, inflation can be observed today because we are not, not going to return back to inflation, right? We live today, all our observations are being done today. So what kind of a signature or signal do you expect to detect to prove this, uh, uh, th that this operator existed and played su such yeah, um, so we, we would be observing what the FML is, so just the size of the non Gaussianity. Um, you could tie it back to the Higgs by, um, well, you, you get information about the mass of the particle just based on the frequency of this oscillatory signal. Yeah, but um, how much non Gaussianity you yeah. expect to get? Yeah, well, this is, <laughs> that's our next slide, I guess. Um, overall, you, you get just an order one FML. If you if you add up all these contributions and if you're lucky enough with um, my v over lambda ratio, yeah, but but I, I'm uh, sorry to inter uh, in, interfere. But look, uh, if we consider the limit where uh, uh, Higgs mass was large, then uh, I would say that you know this uh, additional part of the mass might be less important, right? If the limit of large mass of Higgs does exist. Because if, if my mass of Higgs is large anyway, I mean, independently of d phi square. Right. Well, yeah. So, I mean, this, this, this again is, is assuming that you have a Higgs mass that is of order Hubble during inflation. Um, mm -hmm. If it's much larger, then you wouldn't get this, this oscillating piece. So it is, it is really only sensitive to a specific range of masses. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it means that it's more about, uh, you know, kind of uh, influence of Higgs itself uh, rather than the vector field, right? Um, sorry, what was that? 
No, I mean that uh, that if uh, we are going to the limit of very large mass of Higgs, then it's just uh, what remains is just a heavy uh, vector field, right? Z in your in your model, right? Uh, and uh, and the, the uh, uh, and in this way, uh, it's like a you know, fixed mass, and I mean uh, of uh, vector field. Uh, uh, but what what is this? Uh, but uh, and uh, and it's uh, not it's sensitive not to to the uh, mass of his itself because mass of his is already implied to be uh, larger than everything. Uh, uh, but it's sensitive only to to the okay, vacuum average of his, right? I mean that's it, right? Uh, 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 so that's why I wonder this is this non gaussianity you are discussing uh, is it based on a finite mass of Higgs or it is uh, associated also uh, will appear even in the limit where like mass of Higgs is very large no, but yeah, maybe so here we're working, uh, a finite mass with Higgs yeah like so if you forget about Higgs then uh, you still have the Gauss bosons but uh, according to this figure then the signals are suppressed so it does the dust can less interesting compared to having finite mass here Yes, yes, um, yeah, they, there are, I mean, so the only operators that you're going to get that are, I mean, besides this dimension five switch, I'm just kind of not considering here. Um, the only things you're going to get are these dimension eight these global operators. So um, these won't give you really much, if any, contribution to that for now, um, at least that we can observe. Um, for our purposes, we just computed them as complete as possible, but yeah. So here, really, the, the takeaway is, is for the Higgs, and um, the signal for my gauge boson is just very heavily suppressed. OK, um, you know, I'm going way over time, but just a little bit of forecasting. Um, OK, so kind of looking at, when we look at um, our upcoming experiments that we have and their capabilities of detecting various orders in FNL. Um, anything that we really get from the CMB, there are, I mean, there, there are a lot of um, effects from the CMB that kind of make getting to lower and lower FNL um, pretty non-feasible. We've, we've pretty much mapped, we've mapped the, the CMB to a, a very, very high degree. Um, in stage four, you're going to get only roughly two times the improvement for these FNL um, detection capabilities. Um, since this is of order 10, we're really not going to be able to see anything in the CMB. For large scale structure, we get a little bit better. Um, it's sphere X, um, which I think is like 2024, 2025. Um, this, is, it, this is projected to get an FNL order one. Um, and the thing that we're going to really be reliant on are these 21 centimeter observations. Um, the theoretical reach of this has been calculated to be 0.03. Um, so this could be a really powerful um, way to kind of observe these the FNLs that we see in this model. Um, yeah. Okay, so the overall conclusion that I really want to leave you guys with is just, um, of course, we, we can look at kind of these, these models like this Gage Higgs model, which is pretty well motivated. Um, when we compare results to literature, actually turning on all of these multiple operators, um, carefully considering what the, which operators are redundant in our basis and which are not, um, this allows us to really get this new estimate for what the FNL of the scalar Higgs would be. It is possibly accessible to near future detectors, kind of being reliant again on 21 centimeter observations. Um, but the thing I really wanna kind of drive home is that in order to actually use the cosmological collider as a tool for discovering new particles, um, for probing the standard model at these very high energies, we really need to use a systematic treatment um, and all, like just get the, the physical effects um, from my theory. Um, and this will, yeah, hopefully allow us to distinguish where our FNLs are coming from, what we expect them to be, and what we don't expect them to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm.
you also had a, let's say you had another particle with a physical mass of 10 to the 30, uh -huh. as opposed to a Higgs. Could you distinguish it in the signal? Yeah, um, you could. So, so how, would that, how would that arise? Um, right, so. Because I thought that in the beginning, people were actually putting physical mass particles of 10 to the 13 GV, 10 to the 14 GV. Now, in your scenario, you're not doing that, mm -hmm. inducing a Higgs mass at that scale. Yeah. But then how could you tell the difference? Right, so you can tell that you can try, try to tell the difference by a few different ways. I guess you would be reliant on kind of what the precise mass would be to some extent. Um, you can work in spin information. Um, so for any kind of fermion or- well, Let's say it's a scalar, scalar 10 to the 13. Yeah. A third from the gut physics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in that case, you know, you'd have some work to do. There are some other possible detection mechanisms. I mean, if you were able to, for example, you can also get gravitational wave signals possibly from this. So um, being able to look at, you know, two sort two data sets there would be really useful. Um, yeah, you're, you're pretty reliant on what the, the mass and spin. I guess in your case, the mass also depends on time, right? Because on this side, too. So I guess it is very difficult to see. Like, you know, in principle, there must be some difference, right? Okay. Yeah. If you change the scales, then uh, there must be some difference between the force and mass and this kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just impossible to do. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult. To yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of spectral index. So this also has to be changed. Yes. But what about the solitary feature? Uh, this oscillations. Tell us about oscillations, but where are these oscillations? Oh, so yeah, you would. Um, we don't see oscillations. Well, it's on one slide. You have to. Hmm? <laughs> it's on one slide. So we, I mean, we haven't. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mean where would we see these oscillations, or? No, he wants to see it theoretically, but where did they appear? Uh, well, theoretically, they they appear. You had the slide earlier on. Right? Yeah. No, I mean, because your result was at FML of order one, 0 0.1, but. Right. I mean, that's just a magnitude estimate. Um, yes. Yes. In practice, you would. Um, here. Yeah. So in ah. practice, you have, have this piece that, that gives you a frequency that's mass dependent. Um, Right. This is so FNL is really just a an estimate for what the the magnitude of the non Gaussian waves would be. Um, in practice, especially in twenty one centimeter, where you can take kind of a more three D picture of what is going on, you can get some some sort of time evolution. Um, and in that case, I mean, you can see an oscillation from there. Um, so, like when when the See if when like Planck reports an FNL value, that's like the FNL at like the pivot scale or something like this, but you would really need it at like multiple different scales to see, like different momentum scales to see some oscillation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, at this point, just seeing an FNL would be great. And that would be a nice proof yeah. of principle. Um, in order to get this, this more, right, this more concrete information, you would need. Um, some more like time evolution signatures. Um, which I think is another reason why 21 centimeter could be much more powerful in this case. Time scale there, by the way. It's tens of five years. Oh, scale. on on seeing 21 centimeter? If you get that 0.03. Um, well, I think the 0.03 is projected for um, the, the square kilometer array. Um, and I think I think they're actually taking data now. Um, and they don't have enough data yet and it's not a precise enough instrument. So I think I think roughly a decade from now is when what yeah. we're looking at. That's not that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. but one of the leaders in this field, the E1, who, who when he motivated uh, those observations, he told me in front of us, and you guys talk about future collider. I can, I'm allowed to talk about FNL 0.01. That's the same time scale. That's what he told us. That's okay. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 It's okay. Just go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so if the Higgs field all is a tensor thirty GeV, that means the top work mass is around the same scale of the equation. So do you also get additional numerical scanty from the top work mass being slightly higher than the upper scale of the equation? Yeah, presumably you would. Uh, do you expect it to be of the same order, larger or smaller than what you have said? Yeah, um, I haven't done the calculation myself, so I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that. I just wanted to ask the same question. So is it true that the reason why the Higgs uh, contribution is more in terms compared to the Higgs boson is that you can have this kind of two level uh, diagram and that is because Higgs can have the wave, but the Higgs boson yeah. usually doesn't have any wave. Yeah. So in that case, I would guess that the premium condition is also suffered as compared to the scale of the contribution. Am I correct? Yeah. So the thing that you, know, you have to just uh, make a loop. Right? Yeah. So right. I mean, or maybe there's something. In, I mean, in general, anything that sort of proceeds at the loop level um, is going to be much harder to see. Um, I mean, yeah, you would need some sort of quadratic mixing to really get these three level diagrams or mixed exchange exchange, sorry, uh, double or triple exchange diagrams. It will be loop suppressed if there is no direct mix. Yeah, for instance, uh, in this picture, the left hand side, uh, we have this mixing, right? Yeah. We use this mixing. Same one to use the visual work as That's fine. Also about the, the top work mass. So the like the term which drags, which gives the, the, the Higgs an effective mass, that, that's a like a D5 term. So it should when you plug in the amplicon bev, you'll, you'll get some like epsilons coming out, right? Yeah. So like the, the Higgs mass from that would probably actually be below Hubble, maybe even a couple of quarters of magnitude below Hubble. Is that right? Um, like, to, wouldn't it just be suppressed by epsilon? It, it's H, that, H, that, H, that, H, that, H times R. Are you talking about this topic? No, no, I was talking about the. We were saying the H dagger H D mu phi squared term. Ah, this will be suppressed. Yeah, this will be yeah, suppressed yeah, 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 to H squared. 